what do you want to be an entrepreneur for? Is it real or is it vanity? And I was so offended that I couldn't sleep at night. And I was up the whole night raging, Googling him, watching his TED talk, reading the <laughs> research papers that he wrote. I'm like, how dare he call? I am not vain. Like, what is this? Like, excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lalit Dhano show. Today I have with me a very special guest and she is the sister of Ambi who was there on our show previously. We have Bindu Subramaniam who's a music writer, song composer, a teacher and most importantly the co-founder of Sapa which is their training institute for music and they have touched over 10,000 lives over the last few years. In this episode, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, we're going to talk about music and how you can navigate through your clarity in your career. So I want to know, um, through this process, when did you realize that your interest in business is something that you want to pursue as a career? Because today, you're taking care of so many things, the things that you're learning are also based on that. I can't identify a single moment because I think that everything is a journey and I, I still don't know what I'm going to be doing 10 or 15 years from now. I'm very passionate about what I do today mm -hmm. and I do see myself doing it going forward. But I think I'm a very accidental entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So the whole way that it started off was um, I felt that there has to be a better way to learn classical music, right? Okay. Because so many people will come and say things like, or especially journalists will say things like classical music is dead, right? Nobody likes classical music anymore. And and honestly, in many instances, I've interacted with people who haven't had extremely positive experiences learning classical music, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, I felt like the music has always been great. It's the methodology that needs to change. And how do we change the methodology? And when I was thinking of my own experiences as a child, it was like this cyclo-styled, you know, 10th hand Xeroxed book uh, where, where like the black ink would come off on your fingers and it would be spiral bound and the spirals would be pokey and you know you're sitting on a, on a mat on the floor and you're you know, kind of picking out the bits of the mat and, and that's not a very conducive experience when your outside world is you know cartoons and, and whatever else we had access the to. The stimuli is much more higher. Right. So when I was looking at this current generation or my daughter's generation right we are competing with Chota Beam, we are competing with Alexa, we're competing with all of these other things. And we still want to say that we're running like a Gurukul system. I, it, it doesn't track to me. Correct. So it's like one way to kind of change this is to make a book to teach classical music to babies. That, that was the agenda in the beginning. And I wasn't thinking of myself as an entrepreneur or anything else. But I realized that, you know, I've always liked writing and let me, let me try my hand at writing this book. So. I wrote this book and I went to the printer and he's like, great, you know, 500 copies is the minimum. And I'm like, well, I have three students. He's like, you could try Printo. <laughs> um, and, and then I had a choice to make, right? And that's, that's the hard choice. And the hard choice was to either go down the street to Printo or to kind of commit to something that I wasn't sure that I could follow through on. So I took the loan of 50,000 rupees from my dad at this point and I felt so guilty because I'm like, this is so much money. What am I doing? Like, what if, what if I don't figure this out? And I spent like six months after that figuring out how to distribute these books. I went, I walked into Crossword. I walked into Landmark. I was on the phone with Baby Oi, sending emails to First Cry, Flipkart, all of these people. And this was like 2013, 2014, and this is the point in time where retail was shifting from music stores into toy stores and away from books, right? So books and music were going down and toys were coming up, so clearly nobody's interested. I'm a nobody, nobody knows who I am, I'm just a crazy person waving a book around. And then I was like, well, you know, when we were kids, Scholastic used to be a thing, maybe that's still a thing. And then from there, I was like, okay, maybe I can sell this book in schools. And then we, we contacted a local school and uh, they agreed, like we just begged them and they agreed to let us list, uh, put the book up in their, their book stall or something. And we sold one book, okay? And I was like, I've made it. I've <laughs> sold a book. Small wins. Yeah, right? And I still have that envelope with that 500 rupees stapled and kept 
somewhere. And you know, that 500 rupee note is not valid anymore. That's a different <laughs> issue. Um, but then I was like, okay, what from here? And then I was speaking to schools and then I, I just had a conversation with the librarian and she's like, well, this is fun. I could maybe buy a couple of copies for my school, but you know, who would teach this? Right, and then it goes from there to somebody reaching out to somebody and saying, you know, well, can you teach this program? And then saying, yeah, maybe we could, let's do this. And then I had this incredible mentor who came into my life. And, and so it was this very long journey to entrepreneurship. Wow. And now when I look back at it, or when I'm learning these principles, or when I'm reading these books, or when I'm in these classes and we're talking about management, I'm like, oh, so that's what that is. You know, you call it that. But I was essentially forest gumping my way through throughout the entire Makes experience. Sense. Makes sense. I also want to understand in this part of this process, the only thing that makes it easier is your openness to change and openness Absolutely. to learning. And, and, and I can only think of why people might not do as many things as you're doing right now, even though if they want to do it, because they're not ready for that change. The resistance to change is so high that first they got to understand why they're doing it, their why, and that opens up the doorway. And then in that process, they start learning things. Mm. Now, can you tell me what is the importance of upskilling, especially as an entrepreneur? Because entrepreneur is not just one skill, it is a set of skills which could be bettered and bettered over time. So can you tell me the importance of upskilling? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are watching <laughs> are between that 18 to 25 age. And I think it'll be best to come if it comes out of your mouth. So the thing with being an entrepreneur is you always have to be ready to take the blame no matter who does what. <laughs> and when there's credit, you have to be really generous about sharing yeah. it. <laughs> Having said that, I'm really fortunate because I have this amazing team that does most of the work and, and I do take a lot of the credit. Uh, but the reason upskilling is so important is one, you don't know all the answers. And two, the answers keep changing. You know, when you are at different stages or when your company is in different stages, the things that you need are different. Absolutely. Right? So when you are getting something off the ground, you need to be the person who's doing the strategy and also mopping the floors. There is no other way around it, right? Man. It's your, your business is your computer, yourself in the corner of your house where, you know, you're undisturbed. And then you have a vision board and you're motivating yourself, but you are everything. You are the designer, you are the creator, you are the, the proofreader, you're this. But then as you scale, you need to start bringing in people who are smarter than you. You need to start bringing in people who have better skill sets, but you can't bring those people in too early because you need to understand that nobody knows your business the way that you do, right? Wow. So you're always learning these things. And I, the reason that I'm open and willing to adapt is because I've made all the mistakes. You know, you should never assume you're right. The moment you assume that you're right, you're going to get knocked out. Yeah, and you've never been wrong before. Like, I think that's yeah. the height of being wrong. There's a beautiful quote, I think, which Alan Watts says, says, he says, the moment you say that you don't know anything, then you can understand everything. Mm. But the moment you say, you know, uh, you know everything, that's the time you exactly know nothing. Yeah. So uh, I think it definitely does resonate. Can you also tell me how in this process some of your Stanford programs and the rest of your networking communities came into action and started helping you around? It's been, a, it's, it's been continuous. I've always been fortunate to be surrounded by people who are smarter than me. And I've always been fortunate uh, to be able to reach out to people for help or advice. And I think that comes from having a certain amount of humility. I know I don't know the answers, right? And I'm very honest about things that I don't know. So I'm able to reach out to people and be like, can, can you help me? Or, or, or what do you think? Or what are your perspectives? And, and whether it's people on the team or it's people from outside, I've learned so much. And wow. throughout my journey, two things have been really critical. One has been mentorship and the other has been network. And I used to think that networking was a dirty word because it was like the perception is, you know, you're out somewhere and you're just exchanging vis visiting cards and you're like, who's this guy? Like, what is, can I measure my net worth in, in business cards? And that's not it, right? Networking is really about making meaningful connections with other people. 100%. Without an idea of what benefit can come from it. You're not networking for benefits. You're, you're, 
meeting other people because there is a joy in that. You're talking to other people because there's so much to learn. And then if something comes from it, great. Correct. But it's, it has its value in itself. So Absolutely. now if I look at my Stanford network, for example, I have friends that I learn from every day. One of my friends is the founder of Heads Up for Tails, the pet company. And they're game changing. Completely different from what we're doing. But when I sit and talk to her, I see parallels. So I joke and I say, what you're doing with pets, I'm doing with kids. Nice. Right? Because this overwhelming love for animals, I have this overwhelming love for children. Like, she wants to figure out how to make the world a better place for animals. I want to figure out how to make the world a better place for little kids. Wow. Where I have this other friend who's in medical technology, and I learned so much from him. I have another friend who's in data analytics, and, and it's like stuff that I never had a clue about. But some of the, some of the circumstances that we're in are so similar. You True. know, being an entrepreneur <laughs> is, is generally a lonely journey, but if you have people that you surround yourself with, it's, it's a lot more fun, for sure. I'm sure. Uh and I really like the part where you spoke about giving, right? I think net, be it for your friend who, who's the CEO of Heads Up for Tales or you in your academy or even while networking, right? I think that's the point you, told, uh, you brought about. When you walk into a room filled with people, if you're looking to add value to their lives, then things will automatically start growing your way. It's like being a farmer, right? You're not a hunter here. You're not trying to gather things. You're trying to sow a seed and that seed will turn into a plant and a tree and possibly five or 10 years down the la uh, lane, it could give you its first set of uh, fruit. And then every season onwards from there, it's, it's, it's a great ride. And, and I believe um, that's the way of life. And, and if you can walk into a room or a conversation being a giver, uh, it, it brings about a very spiritual aspect within you in the work you, you do and definitely the thoughts and values you carry along with yourself. Yeah, I think it's it's very deeply linked to a sense of purpose. Yeah. For me, giving back has been fundamental. I, it's something that I've learned from my parents as well, that this we are here to serve others. Can you tell me a little right? more? And so whether it is the outreach work that we do through SAPA, you know, we teach music to 8,000 kids free of cost, government wow. schools, NGO schools, kids have scholarships at SAPA. Uh, or whether it's mentoring companies or individuals that I do on my own time or, or through the Stanford network, or whether it's voluntary positions that I occupy um, with the Australia India Youth Dialogue or All India Management Associations, Young Leaders Council, or even with the Stanford Seed Network itself, I think there is tremendous value in just showing up for other people. Nice. And showing up to make the world better. So every time I meet somebody, my default is what connection can I make for them? Like how can, how can, you know, if I see somebody fascinating here, who else can benefit from knowing this cool person? And so many amazing things come from that. And I think if your baseline is just being open to how awesome people are and how wonderful they are and how much there is to just learn from them and how you can give, then the way that you view relationships becomes much more open. You're 100%. not you're not keeping score. You're not protecting yourself from, mm -hmm. you know, what someone else might do to you or somebody taking advantage of you because you're you're not expecting anything in return. Very true. And I think uh, one of the people that when I think about that line, one of the people that come into my mind are my mentors. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about it just a little bit earlier, because when you go into a mentor. Uh, now, whether you're paying him a fee or not, the value that he provides is way beyond a number. Mm. And can you tell me who are some of those specific people that you learned from? Uh, it need not be on a level of personal relationship. Maybe you just know their name and you, got, and you had a lot of takeaways from them. Can you give me some of your strongest mentors that you've had in your life? So um, I always joke that I have not a mentor, but a fairy god mentor. Okay. Um, and my fairy god, god mentor's name is Nimi. And she's just this incredible, badass entrepreneur who's been working in education for the last 20 years. Wow. She runs a company called Hey Math, which was game changing. Like it, they were the first guys out in the international market before all the ed tech, like they were ed tech before it was ed tech. Uh, and 
the way that I met her was so random and fortuitous. Mm -hmm. She met my parents in Singapore and my mom was randomly telling her that, oh, my daughter wants to start something around music education and maybe you can have a chat with her when you're in Bangalore next. And one day I just, you know, kind of walk into my parents' living room and she's sitting there on the couch. And from there, almost every meaningful business decision that I've made has been in consultation with her. And the thing about great mentors is that they're not always nice to you. Oh, yeah. Right? And they better be not nice. Like, yeah. I mean, like, so when you don't believe in yourself, then they're going to be like, you know what? Hold on. You're awesome. But when you're like, I have this great idea, they're like, shut up. It's an idea. <laughs> I will tell you if it's great. <laughs> so, I mean, having that kind of informal relationship with a mentor is critical. And it's, it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. Uh, and... Throughout, I've also found people that have inspired me greatly, like you've said, right? So there's this professor at uh, Stanford University called Baba Shiv. And the way he talks about neuroeconomics and how our brain responds to things is just incredible. Like, I have had these conversations with him in terms of quantity of time. It's probably been a few hours. But in terms of the way that it's changed the way I perceive the word world, it's been infinite right like once he just threw a sentence at me and he's like what do you want to be an entrepreneur for is it real or is it vanity and i was so offended that i couldn't sleep at night and i was up the whole night raging googling him watching his ted talk <laughs> reading the research papers that he wrote, I'm like, how dare he call? I am not vain. Like, what is this? Va like, excuse me. And the next morning, I stalked him at the breakfast table because we're all at the same hotel. And I'm like, I didn't sleep last night, so you're not going to get to eat breakfast today in peace. And here's it. But he made me think. And what he made me realize, and, and this was at a point where I wasn't sure whether I was a social entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, right? Because this whole idea of giving back sometimes makes you feel like profit is evil. Correct, true. So why should we charge money? Why should we, like, business is bad, right? Mm. So I was in that space for so long. And he's like, is this, is this vanity? Like, are you, are you saying you just want to tell people you're an entrepreneur? And then... It helped me, that night of not sleeping, helped me make the switch of saying, no, you know what? If I was vain, I would just be working on my performance career to be on the cover of more magazines and to get more millions of views and to get a Bollywood song or 10. Because that, to me, is an easier route to fame. But I have this burning desire, for want of a better phrase, to make an impact through business. And I realize I have to get over this unwillingness to talk about money or ask for money or, or think about money, because if I have to create impact, I need to generate revenue. Hmm. And so I went back and I told him, I said, it's not vanity. Vanity would have been Bollywood. This is, this is me. I need to run a business. It's not a social enterprise. It is a business. I am an entrepreneur, goddammit. He's like, perfect. Now get your plate of papaya and let's sit and eat. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's really important that I feel sometimes your, your mentor really gets you closer to yourself. Absolutely. Right? And, and, and there is a part of you that you're so blinded to. And in fact, the biggest blind spot for a human being is himself. Because he can see everywhere, right? And the only way he's going to see himself is in front of a mirror. Mm -hmm. And people don't like standing in front of a mirror. <laughs> they absolutely hit that side, right? They're that's like, vanity. Yeah, that's vanity. Yeah, Like, like you that look right. at it in a perspective that you're not making peace with it. And I think sure. uh, your mentor gave you an amazing re reality check. And today you serve as a mentor to many people in your school. Um, you have been playing that role off your school as well, helping other businesses. So tell me about this part of you becoming a teacher. Uh, how has it impacted your life? How has it changed you? And what are some of the learnings that you've had from that? 
So I think the biggest learning when you sit on the other side and you're a teacher too, so tell me if this tracks with you, is that it's okay to not know all the answers. And it's important to be honest when you don't know the answers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I, I think I can resonate that with a heavily because just two weeks ago I was finishing my semester and one of my students asked me like listen uh, I want to I want to I want to do a course in this specific place and because I've gone abroad I usually tell people how I planned it out but I had no idea about AI I had no idea about it and I said listen I don't know uh, maybe you should find out somebody who's good there. And then somebody else said, you know, is this course good here? I said, I don't know. But then they, they kind of felt disappointed there. But eventually they were happy that I said, I don't know. Because if I gave them wrong information, then I'm not doing justice. So I definitely do agree with you. And I think that comes not immediately, but after a point of time. Uh, because as an individual, I w I'm a speaker, right? I wanted to speak, so I'm a performer. But... I, I thought, okay, teaching will be great. Mm -hmm. but I'm not a performer. I'm <laughs> there, right? I'm trying to unearth the best possible self from that person. So I can't be performing. I have to ask the most important questions. Mm -hmm. And I better, be, I better say no if I don't know it. Yeah. Uh, right? Because it's going to come and bite me in the back someday. Yeah. So yeah. I, I definitely resonate So with I have that. these songwriting students. And I consider myself more of a mentor than a teacher to them. And I've been working with them forever. They're like teenagers now. And, and they're just... They're such tremendous artists, okay? And I always tell them, you know, the worst thing that could ever happen is that you all write exactly like me. <laughs> you know, because the whole journey of being a songwriter is being yourself. Authentic. Authentic, vulnerable, creative. It's all of those things, you know? And if, if I'm trying to teach you how to write like me, you're not doing any of those things. So I need to know my subject. I need to know how to give them the techniques. I need to know how to give them, you know, the rubric to follow. There are tools. There is hard work that has to go into it. But I need to realize that the outcome can be different for each of them. And it should be different for each of them. And I have to give to each of them separately. True. If not, you're just doing what the education system is doing, right? You're trying to, you're, you're pulling off a rat race, trying to make each of them feel good by being the best amongst the rest, like, I mean, the only metric to measure is one thing. Uh, so I think that's a great one. So I also say this, I say that life is a team sport. Yeah. And I believe in non-competitive excellence. Yeah. You know, I know we live in a competitive society, but truly we do better when we work together. Collaborate. So when I look at my songwriting students, they're so happy to collaborate with each other. They step in and they help each other out. They work together. They do all of this because there is enough for everybody. We need to lift each other up, you know? And that's really powerful. So I'm mentoring companies, uh, again, through the Stanford Seed Spark program. And one of the companies is doing something very similar to what we're doing at SAPA. And, they got, and the coordinator asked me, is this competition? And then the owner of that business, again, who I'm mentoring now, called me and said, well, if we're in a competitive space, I understand. I said, look, you know what? There is more than enough space for both of us and there's space for a hundred more. And if there's anything you can learn from the mistakes that I've made, I am more than happy to share with you. If you feel uncomfortable with me because we're in the same space, I get it. But I would be honored to mentor you because I think it's so cool that someone else is trying to do something in the space that we've worked in. Because there's a lot to be done. And I, you know, it's going to take more than one lifetime of one person True. to do it. So l Great. let's do it together. <laughs> I think that's really nice. And when you start doing it together, you start seeing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You start, you know, uh, the, this one quote keeps resonating in my head. Uh, if you want to walk fast, you walk alone. If you want to walk far, you walk together. That's an African proverb. And it's, it's like the favorite proverb of the Stanford Seed Transformation yeah. Network. Yeah, it's nice. on all our decks. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's very beautiful. And, and the only way you can see the beauty of it is to really do it. Mm -hmm. it. And you just can't understand it at a mental level and just say, okay, it sounds great, but I'm going to be the selfish person. Or I'm going to be this one uh, way of looking things kind of person and do it. I think you've got to really experience it to really see the joy 
of working together. Because at some point of time when you're old, when you're dusted, I feel your core values have changed. You'll only look back and see the things that you could do better. And that's where most people suffer through their old age only because of regret. They get ill because of regret. And imagine if you collaborated every single time you thought it was competition. Imagine you wouldn't have a life of regret. So tell me about what you do, Bindu, and tell the world. I know you run uh, an institute called SAPA. Tell us more about it. What do I do? That's, that's a really hard question because, um, <laughs> as I was telling you, I don't think any of us do or should do just one thing. There's mm -hmm. an idea of focus and all of that. But uh, I think of myself as a person who wears many hats, right? I'm a singer-songwriter, and that's kind of core to my identity. I see myself as an entrepreneur, um, an author, an educator, uh, and I just I do whatever is fun. So in the <laughs> in the context of Sapa, what we really look at is making music a meaningful part of every child's life, and mm -hmm. that happens in two ways. One is through our partnership with schools, and we work with about a hundred schools, kind of building the ecosystem for music there, where we give them you know our own textbooks and learning materials, audio video materials. We do teacher training. We have uh, uh, syllabus. We have you know, it's it's kind of how do we make music exciting for kids? And we look at interdisciplinarity. How does music relate to science? How does music relate to math? How does music relate to social change? We've wow. got our own teachers. So we've got our own teacher training program. We've got assessments. And that's something that kind of keeps us busy. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, on the other side, we have our SAPA centers. And we were 10 centers pre-pandemic. And then everything went online, of course. And there we look at teaching Indian and Western classical and contemporary music. So that, in a nutshell, is what SAPA is about. But really, at the heart of it, it's about making music meaningful, making it exciting, creating curriculum and teacher training that, that resonates with everybody in some way. That's really nice. And, and the way you said it, I know for a fact that you're beyond just an entrepreneur, you're beyond just a musician. And many people today, especially the ones who've been there and made it successful, also have this one thought process saying, the more you focus on one thing, the better you will get at it. Now, I want to ask you that same question because you're doing multiple things. And not just that, when we were speaking, you also told me that you have multiple educational qualifications as well, not just one or two degrees, but you have eight, right? Now, tell me, how do you run through this and what is your take on the same? So that whole 10,000 hours thing that exploded, and then if you look at Angela Duckworth talking about grit, and all of that makes sense, right? I mean, I think that expertise is integral in whatever you do. So whatever you do, you need to work really hard at it, and your hard work needs to be consistent. So mm. I totally agree on that part. Where I think it doesn't fully cover it is, I don't think we live in a society anymore where we do just one micro thing, right? So your 10,000 hours, yes, but they're divided into different things or you are doing multiples of 10,000 hours, right? Yeah. So if I'm looking at degrees that I have, uh, I read too many John Grisham books as a child. So I thought it was really a very cool idea to be um, a corporate lawyer. I dressed up as a lawyer for Halloween uh, and <laughs> I, you know, I tried to put candy in my briefcase and, and things like that. And then at the end of law school, I did these internships and things like that. I was like, you know what? I really don't want to be a lawyer. Like, this is, this is not what I was meant to do. Hmm. Um, but of course, since I had a bachelor's degree in law, I did the only logical thing, even though I didn't want to be a lawyer, and that was to get a master's degree in law, where I started looking at intellectual property. And then I was done with law. Um, and I was like, what I really want to do is, is songwriting and music business. So I did those. Um, and then I was like, this is good, but I want to keep learning. And... Uh, so I did a diploma in Montessori education uh, because I want to see how kids learn. I want to see how we can make learning more exciting for them. And then I did an MPhil in cultural studies. And the whole idea around that was, you know, what was the impact of Indians and Indian Americans on American pop music from the 1950s? Like wow. when we look at contemporary music, there's so much kind of culture behind it, how much of it is exoticization, how much of it is, is you know, real representation and so on and so forth. And then... You know, I was like, okay, let me do a PhD. And then I did a PhD in how to teach music to children <laughs> uh, and developing new methodologies. And then I, I finished that and I was like, you know what would be really cool? Like, I don't have an MBA. I feel like I'm an entrepreneur. I should have one of those things. And then I chanced upon this thing called the Stanford Seed Transformation Program, which is 
an amazing, incredible experience, and it was absolutely game-changing for me. So I think that all of these things that I've done could seem extremely disjointed, and maybe when I was doing them, they were, but I feel like now they all make sense in the larger picture of who I am and, and what I want to be. And I don't think I'm done learning yet, and I don't think I'm done reaching that point. Yeah. But it's a journey, and I think learning is a very important part of the journey throughout. So yes, specialization, focus, 10,000 hours. But I think that's just a really great way of saying, don't be distracted. Hmm. Find your place for deep work, right? This deep work theory is like, okay, so when you're writing, you are only writing. Correct. When Correct. you're teaching, you are only teaching. Like if you look at somebody like Adam Grant, for example, right? The man is unequivocally regarded as a genius, right? But he's a thinker, he's an educator, he's a writer, he's a speaker, he's so many different things. Hmm. But what he does is he doesn't parallel process them as much as possible. Correct. So I think, I think there are ways to reconcile this idea of hard work and focus with the ability to do more than one thing. I think that does make a lot of sense because today, especially even if you scheme this down to a very normal, usual person who wants to apply for a corporate job. I'm a normal, usual person. <laughs> no, 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 no doubt about he that. He called me abnormal. <laughs> no, I'm just saying at the end of it, if, even if, okay, let's put it this way. Like if people are really clueless and the only thing that comes to my, their mind is a corporate job. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the person who's trying to um, hire them is looking for somebody who could do more than just one thing, right? For example, yeah. if you're a good video editor, you better know a little bit of digital marketing as well because sure. so that goes hand in hand. Um, or if you're really good at content, you, you could also understand design a little more. Yeah. Because it, 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 it's, a, it's a process where things go hand in hand. And li like you said, it, it might not make sense learning too many things at that moment, but like Steve Jobs says, if you if you can connect the dots looking backwards, it yeah. does make all the sense in the world. Right? I mean, he clearly wasn't thinking about fonts when he did the calligraphy course, 100% right? true. But at some point, it will all make sense, or it should all make sense if yeah. you're not living yeah. your life in these silos. So I think when you with the, with the example that you gave in a corporate job, it's about looking beyond your you know, your input is one single cog in the wheel. Correct. How am I contributing to the larger picture? What do I want the larger picture to be? Absolutely. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I want to really pick your brains on this because I've had a lot of guests on my episode, but nobody uh, who's, who, who's done multiple things and done so much amount of searching to understand what they really want to do. Some of them were born artists, like, you know, they, from the minute they touched the, like, you, like, let's say your brother, you know, from three years onwards, he was just on the flute. I'm not saying he doesn't know anything else, but I'm just saying now it opens your doors to learn a lot of more things. And I think on that note, uh, I want to ask you my last question for this interview. Uh, it's a very corporate job. Uh, interviewer question. Oh no! <laughs> where, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? What do you want to be doing? I have no idea what my title would be or you know how I'm going to get there. I cannot promise that there will be no more degrees along the way because <laughs> uh, I always want to learn. In five to ten years I see myself bringing joy to people. My personal vision statement if I may is that Every person that I come across should feel loved. Mm. I know that sounds crazy cheesy. No, no, no. I know no. it does. I, I no, think no, no. It. But like at, at some point, it, it sounds like really, you know, unicorns and butterflies and all of that. So I don't know how I'm going to reach that. But my why for being on this planet is to make people feel loved and awesome. to make people feel valued. So 10 years from now, I don't think that is going to change. Yeah. The chair that I'm sitting in might change. The way that I create this impact may, might change. But this is the purpose that I see for wow. myself. No, I, I for one, I, then if you, if you're calling that cheesy, I think I'm extremely cheesy too. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> no, no, but think about it. If you, if you go down to the root of spirituality, mm -hmm. or if you go down to the root of the greatest teachers in the world, the greatest transformers in the world, be it from Jesus, Allah, Rama, or anybody, the one thing that they've always done is give back and give back with utmost love and that's why it's it's made them who they are right and that's why we look up to people who've just ordinary people who've just operated with love have become so successful uh, so 
I definitely resonate with what you're saying because without love, there is no meaning. It's life becomes black and white. There is no meaning. I'm so glad I had this podcast <laughs> with, with you. Um, uh, there's so much that I can bounce off now, and now I can also look at as look at you as one of my peers. So more than this podcast, yes. <laughs> I, I'd be calling you every now and then. <laughs> I, I, so so I, I hope I know you don't like notifications, but uh, I hope you could see some of mine sometime. I will always respond. <laughs> that you know you you can ask anybody. I'm I'm responsive. I just don't like interruptions <laughs> no worries <laughs> but thank you so much for coming it's been a it's been an amazing um, journey uh, on this last 30 minutes for me I was able to resonate at multiple levels you took me back in timeline and I'm sure the audience that is watching right now will definitely bounce off some of the ideas that you've given us thank you one more time Bindu for coming on my show and sharing your wonderful journey thank you for having me I would love for you to share any feedback you get after this episode and we should keep talking Absolutely. Thank you so much.